Hey uh, friends, Dave Flight of Scanner Missing Project, copyrighted edition for our video page. This is a missing person segment, and it's a good one. This one is going to uh, challenge mind in a lot of ways. And if you've seen the movie, you're going to see how this all applies. So, <clears throat> a couple things. I got a text from a friend that uh, is camping right now in the desert. And uh, these people are very smart and they know what is and what is not a weird track. They sent me this picture <coughs> five hours ago and they said this was the only track anywhere in their area. Nobody's around them for miles. And there's the track. How many times have I told you about tracks that are found and there's only one and there's nothing else for miles? How does that happen? It's a, uh, it's quite a conundrum and uh, it's happened to me quite a bit. It happened to them within the last 24 hours and they're in Arizona and they said, you know, if there was anything walking around here, People would see it because there's a lot of campers out in that area so don't know quite what to make of that but since this is about missing people uh, I did do a show about a couple people missing in the Los Angeles area and it's very heartbreaking I, I definitely told you that I wasn't sure that those were 411 cases but a lot of you asked about it so I, I highlighted that now these next two cases really challenging on multiple levels but let's get to the letters hey Dave I just finished watching missing 411 the UFO connection for a second time one of the details I missed the first time was in the man who claims he was uh, abducted where he said that he was returned and he was dropped sounds like he was quite literally dropped off at the end of his ordeal that's what it sounded like the part that resonated most with me was when you said in the many cases of missing people, the part about being dropped is edited out of being reported to the public. It reminds me of something you said in interviews in your YouTube videos that if law enforcement agencies and the government can't rationally explain it, they don't even want to talk about it. Your interview with John D'Souza, I loved it. He comes across so full of credibility. John D'Souza, retired FBI agent. I highly respect him for having the courage to speak out about things publicly. 25-year FBI man, left, couldn't stand the stuff that was going on in the FBI at the time, and is going on now. I also have a lot of respect for the retired RCMP person you interviewed. I believe she was in British Columbia for stating things as clearly as she did about not without holding the truth from families. It's very interesting. More to come on this, I'm sure. Your dedication to this subject and open-mindedness to the possibilities of what happened to these people is greatly appreciated especially by the family members of the missing. Thank you. <clears throat> the family members of the missing. Most important thing to me when I'm making a documentary. Number one, that they approve that I'm talking about the family. Number two, that I get the facts straight. And those two things are tantamount family member ever said, hey, I don't want this on your TV or on your documentary, of course I wouldn't do it. It's a very sensitive thing. The vast, vast 99.9% .9 of the families want their story out there because that's the only hope of their family being found, family member being found. Next letter. Hey Dave, saw your most recent video. And I got to thinking over how and how much we could influence Bigfoot behavior. Bigfoot hates electronics. Well, maybe you could come up with electronics or other Bigfoot stuff doesn't like in order to see if that could lead to a spike in Bigfoot activity in adjacent areas. Don't think so. Alternatively, one could set up electronics in order to see if it could cause areas with high activity to spike still more. Beyond that, have you checked missing for one victim's histories for sexual abuse? given it's sad to be a number one factor in UFO abductions. They go through autopsy, and I've never heard of one 
coming back with that. Probably, but I don't recall your having mentioned it. After reading between the lines, you seem increasingly sure these entities have followed their prey for some time prior to having abducted them. Hmm. You shared a story where a victim saw UFO lights sometime prior to their being abducted. Again, you got me thinking. Perchance, there's a subset of people whose entities have tagged for observations for various reasons, like bloodlines and Germans, but also maybe via frequently visiting some of the entity's favorite haunts. And out of the pre-selected subgroup, all or most of the abductions occur. If, sir, if so, though, it's bad news for German elk hunters around Yosemite, isn't it? I don't know about around Yosemite, but in Wyoming, true. Thing is, even where my... Th theory might be all right, we don't know what the signs of being tagged by these energies might look like or what population percentages has been tagged. Just 3% of the U.S. population being tagged say would be around 10 million. Look up the number of people that have claimed they've been abducted. Check out that number. In any case, maybe you could or already have asked the victim's families if their loved one had any strange UFO paranormal experiences leading up to the disappearance. <laughs> yeah. That's the first thing you're going to lead with? I don't think so. When a family loses a loved one, they don't want some quack wacko coming around asking what may be perceived as a dumb question. You've got to tread very lightly in that area. You've got to gain their respect and their dignity and your credibility. To come across with a question like that would turn off probably 90% of the families within the first 10 hours they meet you. No, I would never ask that at least until I know them very well. Alternatively, maybe the entities just wouldn't want to tip their hand prior to abducting someone. But keep in mind, you mentioned there seems to be some randomness involved as to when and how they take them. So maybe there's a pattern to be found. Well, I, I think in 11 books I've established that pattern. If you read them, you'd understand. Profile points. Cluster areas. Intellects people with some type of ailment. I think we've done a pretty good job. Nobody else has touched us to, to this point. Nobody's come close to even researching the issue. Also, uh, this is a new one, new email. I also wanted to state that while I had spikes in reference to the strange, uh, hold on a minute, blah, blah, blah. I do have a theory, you see. I'm a big fan of Dr. Stephen Greer's and I've paid very close attention to his work, especially his conference he did prior to the film Unacknowledged, where he basically wanted to take four hours to get as much information out as possible should something happen to him. It's about four hours, and while it covers most of the topics in his documentary, he was able to go into more detail on some of the things in it. The main thing being that the possibility of a plan to execute a false flag attack using back-engineered technology to emulate an attack on Earth. Okay. If you don't know Dr. Greer, emergency room physician who doesn't work anymore, I don't think, and he just makes movies. He has a theory that all aliens that visit Earth are good. Unfortunately, there's nothing to support that. There's a lot to support the fact that some of them might not be good. All you have to do is read the reports of people who are forcibly taken off of Earth. Start with that. Now. If you believe in Dr. Greer and what he says, then it's in definite, definite conflict with what we just presented in our movie. Is it or isn't it? You tell me. Be very careful because the people who haven't seen the movie and are just fishing around the outside think that that's what I said. I never said alien life took anybody. No. For a fact. I may have paraphrased, but you get the gist. Well, one theory is if I was a person in a program like the one described that was trying to make something look otherworldly to fool the average citizen into thinking they were being invaded by ATs, I would use a combination of practical effects and we'll say special effects such as the likes of Project Bluebeam, for example, not to mention the possibility of using consciousness altering technology. Now, I can't speak for the special effects and the mind control technology, although I know you're very well versed in the possibilities of their use. But when it comes to the practical sides, I believe that one way to get damn near everybody to think alien first instead of se uh, secret government craft 
when they were to see one of these things would be to sample, almost stupidly simple even. That is to put tentacles on the damn thing. Yes, tentacles. What's more alien to us humans than anything with tentacles? Yeah. The only thing I can think of that comes close to something different but similar. And what happens to be well spider legs? I think that the people, for whatever reason, are extremely unnerved by anything that has too many moving appendages. appendages. And that's with creatures. But just imagine when you think of instinctual fear and you put that on a gargantuan silent floating craft in the sky, paint it black, I'm sorry. Well, the ones he mentioned were from a few decades before. Okay, well, um, a few years ago, my brother, my best friend, and I witnessed a massive football so field-sized, three-story tall, silent black rectangle gliding not far from the treetops in our hometown of Blum, Texas, the surface of which looks similar to what you would see on most solar panels in terms of re reflectiveness and color. On the front and back of the object were a set of massive bay doors. I remember after seeing whatever the craft was about Fort Worth, I call, I call thinking about the rectangle I'd seen years before. You know, to make rectangular look undeniably alien, all one would have to do is to be a stick, some wacky, creepy, black, squiggly things on it. I also happen to believe there's a lot of technology deployed in these things. Yeah, for sure. I gotta move on from that. Hill and Boss counties in Texas have such strange anomalous things happen to an almost daily basis that I can't keep up. Please pay attention to this area. You'll hear more from me about different things and I know that you read every letter that you get, which is amazing, Dave. That's dedication right there. And the village appreciates it that I know. Sorry again for the long email. I do not mean to spend three hours writing these tonight, but it happens. And I won't read something that's huge and long. If you can't say it in three paragraphs, you can't say it. So please keep it short and I'll try to get as many as I can. Next letter. Stumbled onto your excellent can I Missing YouTube channel just after I retired and followed you for almost two years. I've seen Vanished. Vanished is a TV show I did for the History Channel, and you can watch it on Amazon. <clears throat> and your three documentaries, each five out of five stars in my opinion. And I've admired how you've stuck to the facts and let the villagers come to their own conclusions. Now, what's funny about that? I got a bunch of hate mail this week. You know what? Your shows are worthless because you don't ever state your opinion. Why don't you state your opinion? I don't say my opinion because of the same trolls putting that out there are just there to attack anytime anyone puts an opinion up. And they'll find conflict in an opinion. And then if you are ever found that your opinion isn't true, then you're worthless and you should go home. So if you can't put out an opinion that you could support 100%, why say it? I've also seen your, you appear in a documentary series, National Park Secrets and Legends, discussing the disappearance of Rosemary Kuntz who went missing by a lake near Mount Shasta. When I saw your YouTube video from Lake McDonald, I had to chime in about Lake McDonald's here in Glacier National Park, about an underlying story that has always gnawed at me. My surname originates from Germany, so you might say I have vested interest in what you say. There's a persistent rumor that ex-Nazis, through Operation Paperclip, went to a lodge by Lake McDonald and Glacier National Park, all for the purposes of continuing their flying saucer program within an underground facility, which coincidentally, coincidentally just so happened to be a, a story in the same documentary series you appeared in. I've watched all those shows. I never appeared in anything like that that I know of. <laughs> to me, however, there's some connections to this Lake McDonald story that makes sense. German physicists and people with German surnames have gone missing. Were they abducted to the experimented on or to work on multidimensional mathematics or to physically work within an underground facility? For starters, I've never heard the Lake McDonald story or living underground at Glacier National Park or anything close to that, or the Germans ever being in or around the park. I've never heard of that. 
So I'm not sure where that came from, and they didn't cite any source. Two, a high degree of UFO saucer activity has occurred in Wyoming, Washington, Idaho, BC, and Utah, all surrounding regions to Lake McDonald and Glacier National Park. Do they originate from underwater happenings? Again, I've never heard that. In the latest Pentagon UFO report released, one of the bullet points addressed was that UFO technology could have been developed by a clandestine group of people. Has a secretive advanced group of people conquering, traveling through multi-dimensions by now? Hmm. Dave, what are the chances this bizarre story has unfolded so close to where you live? Zero. I've never heard it. I've asked everyone I know. Nobody's heard it. You don't cite a source, so how can I even give it two cents of authority? Sorry. Next story. A request for there to be another criteria added when it comes to questioning people like Mr. Carl Higdon. Oh. Mr. Politis, please bear with me as I respectfully request that you add another criteria when questioning those abductees and others, as is appropriate who have been returned, like in the case of Mr. Higdon, and right up front, it has to do with an aspect having to do with Christian faith, and please do not give the request, and please do give the request some serious thought. There have been cases where the abductee have been screened and then rejected. In the case of your subject, it was assumed that this rejection was based solely on the vasectomy. I believe that very probably had nothing to do with his rejection, but rather, more than likely, it had to do with his faith or lack thereof. Well, first of all, the people that abducted him somehow knew he had a vasectomy because he never told them. So how would they know? This is where it gets religious. So, so to speak, and again, please don't dismiss this perspective without giving it some serious thought. My theory is that when the subject was screened behind the panel for medical screening, it was revealed that these other outwardly beings, whether or not he was born again by being revealed if his soul had the indwelling of a spirit of God. Understand that for the non-believer or the unchurched, which it is not to say that they are either, but for a lot of people there is a bit too far-fetched. While for the Christian believer, it makes perfect sense. So, this is obviously somebody who knows nothing about my work. Because I've written about leaders of churches that have disappeared that completely match our profiles. So... When you say looking at the soul, or this, it's so far fetched that I'll give it to you. That's a very strange one. But I've never heard anybody coming back from an abduction saying those things. Now, me asking somebody about their religious beliefs, very personal question. I try to ask questions that don't offend somebody and don't put them off and don't shut them down. Now, when you ask somebody, are you a religious person? Well, what that means to that person and what that means to that person are totally different things. And then what if somebody says, well, I may not be religious, but I'm spiritual. Different levels. Born again what? What's wrong with somebody who was just always religious their whole life? Why do they have to be born again? And then what would be the level in the criteria for walking behind a panel and seeing if your soul was occupied by religion? Who's the judge on that? Uh, are you, if you don't go to church, are you still religious? If you read the Bible and don't go to church, are you religious? If you read the Bhagavad Gita, are you religious? People don't understand that saying something like this <clears throat> it's very wiggly line and you just get torn apart by others if they hear you ask something that's so open-ended and not measurable sorry uh, if you've read my books and you obviously didn't you'd know that every time I find an entry about somebody who is missing about their religious beliefs, I put it in. But as far as going back and asking them, again, that's a squiggly line that 
just going to get you into trouble, in my humble opinion. And it's going to offend somebody. So, <clears throat> let's start off. Several years ago, I was researching cases of disappearances in Europe. And just recently, I started to get back on that bandwagon. And I came across a case I've never seen before, never heard before, and never read about anywhere else. But this was going through archival material. And it came out of Canada. And the young man's name, and I can tell you this, this hit me hard the other night when I was doing the research on it because I was thinking about Ben, and you're going to see why. This young man's name was Duncan McPherson. He was 23 years old when he disappeared August 9th or the 10th, 1989, from Stubayer Neustift, Austria. It's a ski area. It's a glacier. This is Duncan. He was the 20th overall pick by the New York Islanders in the NHL draft. He played as a defenseman for the WHL Blades from 82 to 86, and he played three seasons for the American Hockey League for the New York Islanders. He had several injuries that haunted him during his career, slowed him down, never made the NHL. I'm sure that was his big dream, and I feel horrible that he didn't make it. And he always got... He was always injured or beat up in some way. But the coaches made comments that he was the top physically conditioned athlete ever at all the camps. He was a fit, physical fitness fanatic. Many player or many of the coaches stated he wasn't the greatest player, but he was reliable, big, and physically fit and smart. Now he lived in Saskatoon with his family and his brother and the family dog named Jake. And Jake, the dog, would run with Duncan when he was home all the time. Now, that's a picture of Duncan when he was playing with the WHL Blades. He was an assistant captain, and then he was the captain for several of his teams. Well, what happened was, is 1989, his New York Islanders contract expired and he started looking for a place to go in hockey. He knew he wasn't going to make the NHL, so he needed to make a living. So he found a, a team in Scotland where he could be the player coach. And he started in August 1989. Now, August 2nd, Duncan left Saskatoon. And for Scotland by way of Europe. On, the, uh, <clears throat> on August 4th, he phoned home, talked to his parents, who he was really close with and close, closest with his, with his brother. And in, he went to Germany where he met a friend that he used to play with. And that friend let him borrow a red Opel Corsa vehicle while he was in that area. Well, on the 8th of August, he left for Bolzano, Italy. He wanted to tour the, the Alps area. Well, on the, uh, he was supposed to be in Scotland on the 12th for the job. On the 10th, and the coaching coaches were adamant, on the 10th of August, they said that he called. And then he fell off the face of the earth. Everybody was concerned. The coaches, his family, his friends, his girlfriend. And the family went to Canada first and asked for help because they needed more searching assistance. And they figured out that he was in an area called the Stubayer Ski Area in Austria. Well, it wasn't until the 21st of September, uh, more than a month after he disappeared, that they found the opal in the parking lot of that ski area. And the police went into it, and they found that it contained Duncan's property. Well, what happened after he disappeared, they cordoned it down, and they figured out that he was at that ski area, but they hadn't found the car. But the police said that he returned his ski equipment, snowboarding equipment, to the resort. 
So they didn't think he was on the mountain, but they weren't sure where he was at. But Canada decided to send over <clears throat> over a dozen searchers in their canines to help search for Duncan. Well, his parents had been in Austria for weeks and they brought Jake over and Jake tried to search, couldn't find him. And on October 15th, 1989, his parents flew home because even though the car was at the ski resort, they were not having any luck finding him. But they also determined that that morning of the 10th that he had taken a snowboard lesson. And that was the same time he supposedly talked to the coaches in Scotland. So Canada listed him as a missing person. This is the official missing persons poster on him. Now, after Canada had sent over over a dozen people and canines to search, and the family had been there for weeks, they had to give up. And it was devastating, devastating to Duncan's family, his brother, his girlfriend. Now, you, I told you that he was in Italy just a, a day or two before his disappearance, and this makes a lot of sense because this is the ski resort he was at right here. Here's Italy right here. In the, in the Alps area, there's a lot of countries that are very close. They're almost like states in the United States. Here's Innsbruck. So he was driving the major routes in here in the Opal. He was going to get it back to his friend, and then he was going to fly out for Scotland. But he disappears here. Now, if people have been following my videos for a while, they're going to remember something about this that sounds familiar. I've never talked about this case before, but hold on. So nothing's heard about this case for 14 years. Stunning. July 16th, 2003. <clears throat> Somebody's grooming a, one of the slopes and a machine operator at the 9,000 foot level thinks he uncovered a body. Well, he calls the police, they came out, and it took them two days to remove the body from this area. It was frozen. And on the body was Duncan's credit card, a nameplate was on his coat. But think about this. They're grooming an area for skiing. Well, if they're grooming that area, there shouldn't be any crevasses there ever, because that's for skiers. So everyone's perplexed. Why wasn't he found? Etc. 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 So the police come up with a theory that said that he was right in the chair that day, and he fell off. Hmm. He fell off in an area that wasn't to be skied, supposedly. And then he walks, which is not easy, and goes over a fence to an area that's closed and takes off on a snowboard, falls in a crevasse, and isn't found for 14 years. That's their theory. A couple problems with that. It's claimed that the body moved in the glacier 200 feet from an area that was closed to an area that wasn't. That's pretty weird, huh? So the coroner that got the body said that he couldn't do an autopsy and he couldn't figure out the cause of death. Well, the parents pushed really hard for more information. So they did a CAT scan and guess what? They found there's no broken bones. Hmm. So I ask you, friends. It's very hard to ride a chairlift and not have people around you within three or four chairs. In most places I've been to, and I've been skiing since I was six years old. So if Duncan fell into an area that was closed, you'd think that somebody else on that chair would have reported it 
and they would have searched. Hmm. But the theory is he falls, and then he walks, and he climbs over a fence into an area that's closed. I don't believe it. I don't believe the whole thing. And neither did the family, because they were misled from the very beginning by the police and told that Duncan turned in his snow equipment, and he was found with his snow equipment. The McPhersons flew back to Austria because they wanted to see the spot where their son was recovered. And when they get there, it's such a driving rainstorm that they couldn't get out to the site. So the police said he fell, okay, but no broken bones, okay, no cause of death, okay. The bodies moved after the fall. That's a lot of... That's a big, to me, a big humdinger. I don't know. The interesting thing is the police said he fell. He fell probably because there was closed circuit cameras at the top that would have showed him coming off. Well, have you watched our movie? Duncan's case is unusual. Super healthy, super smart. Young man, 23 years old. Keep those thoughts because the next case is a humdinger. This is the next man, Jonathan Miles Robinson. Technical name Jonathan went by Miles. 23 years old. Yeah, that's right. Same as Duncan. We're missing 12 22 2009. Yeah, that's right. 20 years almost exactly from when Duncan disappeared. And he went and disappeared in Wengen, W E N G N, Switzerland. This had a lot of international intrigue at the time because it was a beautiful setting. Jonathan was an intellectual. And Jonathan uh, was a recent graduate from Newcastle University for math and economics. Yes, he was very smart. In between semesters at one point, he went to Ghana and he taught soccer to the kids there. He was a good soul. Tight family. He had a special girlfriend. For 15 years straight, his family flew to the Swiss Alps from England for Christmas vacation. Now, Wingen sits at the base of Eiger, the mountain. Gorgeous place. Gorgeous. Now, you guys are saying, well, Dave, you're getting into some intrigue here. Explain it to us. All right. So, this is where Duncan disappeared over at the Glacier ski area. And this is where Miles disappeared over at Wingen. It's 140 air miles. Guys are the same age. That's pretty weird, isn't it? So let's keep going because it's going to get stranger. So his family had gone there every year for 15 years. Jonathan knew this area like the back of his hand. There's a cog train that goes from Lauterbrunnen to Wengen, or you have to take a five mile hike. So everyone takes the cog train. Well, on, a, on December 21st, Miles left the Iger Hotel where his family and him were staying. And with family and friends, they went out for dinner. Afterwards, the majority of those friends went to a place called the Blue Monkey and they were playing pool and drinking. And at 2 a.m. the following morning, Miles walked a female friend of the family's to her room. The girl's name was Amy O'Brien. And CCTV photos caught the pair leaving the bar at 2.19 a.m. And Miles left Amy's room at 2.50 a.m. His hotel was about 200 yards away on a very slow moving street. Nobody drives, everybody walks. 
and he never made it back to his room. His parents and his family reported it the next morning to the police. And it was a feeling of the parents that they weren't moving fast enough and they didn't really care that much. The parents made a statement that this was 100% out of character for him and that the family knew something very strange had happened. The mom was an administrator for the UK ski team. And she said, my son doesn't care for hiking or spontaneous craziness. So he didn't go on some midnight hike. Well, immediately the police came out with canines, helicopters, ground teams, searched the area out to about five miles. Family believed that Miles had to have been kidnapped, but they didn't know how. Hold that thought. He was 6'5", in perfect athletic condition. He would have been a formidable target. He always played sports, always was an athlete. Well, he disappears on the 22nd. He's reported early in the morning on the 23rd missing. And the family went out because the Swiss police weren't doing enough in their mind. And they hired a group of private searchers, professional searchers, they call themselves. And the first day outside of uh, Lauterbrunnen, 330 feet down a rocky cliff, they see a body in plain sight. So here's Wingen, where he was last seen. There's Lauterbrunnen, and then there's cliffs going off the side of Lauterbrunnen. The cog train that runs between these two cities that takes people back and forth stops running at midnight. When he's last seen at 2.50 a.m., the train wasn't running. And it's a five-hour hike through the mountains to get there. Well, that's pretty weird, huh? So, let's go by that timeline. Police find the body. And they also find his, his cell phone. And they find the cell phone made a call at 3.26 a.m., and it called the first person on his contact list. Talking to cell authorities, when the phone is dropped really hard, that's what it'll do. It's an automatic call. Does that mean something, folks? The phone stopped operating at 5 a.m. So, he leaves Amy's room at 2.50 a.m. At 3.26, a little more than 30 minutes after he's last seen, that phone gets dropped hard way down in Lauterbrunn and five hours away by foot. Cog, trail, cog train wasn't working. How did it get there? How did he get there? The coroner issued an open verdict which means to him that there was possibly foul play involved, but they couldn't prove it. He had multiple broken bones. And guess what? He had no shoes. He had no socks on when they found him. Wake up, people. I've said this for the last 10 years. This is important. So Miles was dropped or he fell. And in December, in Switzerland, at 2 a.m., it's really cold. Miles is not going to walk around in bare feet. Now, the police and the professional searchers searched the area around where his body was for hours. That's how they found the phone, and that's how they found other things. But they never found the shoes and the socks. So he was an athlete, he fell, he was highly educated, smart, in a ski area, town. They can't explain how the body got there. Just like they can't explain how Duncan's body got there. 
Now, you know I've talked about GHB before. In this case, there's another very odd incident that came through. The family paid for a secondary autopsy. Remember I told you, you got to do this in these cases. And one, because they only, these small town corners will only search for a limited number of ingredients or substances in the blood. Homework assignment. Look up PMA, Paul Mary Adam. It's called Dr. Death in the Blood. And one of the coroners said that this was in the bloodstream. And this must have attributed in some way to his death. I wish I could be there to talk to the families when some of these people make these claims. So understand something. I understand that's in the blood. But when he went to Amy's room, and when he separated from his friends and family at the Blue Monkey, he wasn't acting odd. He wasn't staggering around. He didn't lose control. He was fine. And he had a 200 yard walk back to his room. And he had made and walked that area hundreds of times before in the previous 15 years. Nobody believed he could get lost. Also in the blood, they stated that his blood alcohol level was 0.16, two times the legal limit. So what? So what? Again, he wasn't staggering. On CCTV, he was walking completely normal. And he wasn't driving a car. He was only walking 200 yards. So the coroner finds this PMA. I've never heard that on one of my cases before. So this is a little intriguing. It's kind of like the GHB found and also young males that disappear and are later found in water. So they're saying Duncan fell, saying off a chairlift. They have no evidence to support that, but that's a theory. That's guaranteed Jonathan fell because that's what he died from, multiple abrasions, contusions, and broken bones. But nobody, nobody wants to acknowledge the big elephant in the room. How did Jonathan get there? Come on. You can't ignore this. And then the families in Duncan's case said some things were explained, but other things haven't been explained. And they stated that they didn't trust the police and their theories because the police had obviously lied to him in the past. Yeah, I'm frustrated. Two great young men disappeared under very odd circumstances. Now remember again in Jonathan's case, point of separation. He isn't alone until he leaves Amy's room. Important point. In Duncan's case, if he was, if he fell off a chair, there couldn't have been anyone around to see it, otherwise it would have been reported. Now, do I think he fell off a chair? No. You know how rare it is to fall out of a chair? <laughs> it just never happens. I mean, it does happen once in a while, but it's very rare. Uh, now, in my research, I've written about several people who have disappeared at ski resorts. As odd as that sounds. And I'm not talking about cross-country skiing. I'm talking about big resorts. There was a case you know, a lot of people have heard about out of northern New York where a Canadian firefighter captain was skiing with a bunch of friends and he disappeared. Days later, he wakes up and he's on a truck going cross-country still in his ski stuff. And the trucker drops him in Sacramento, California. And he calls the police because he doesn't even know where he's at. And he said that he, last thing he remembered, he was on the ski slope and then he wasn't. 
Well, that's pretty suspicious. And then about 40 miles from where that man realized he was awake and alive, which was in the Sierras outside of Sacramento, there was another skier, a former military officer, that disappeared while skiing within probably 30 miles of North Lake Tahoe at a big resort. He was never found. Everybody thought that the following spring, when the snow went away, they'd find, they'd find me. How can you miss? The skis, the boots, the poles, be there forever. But he was never found. How does that occur? Ski resorts are one of those anomalies in our research where things have continually happened. Unexplained, unusual, but have happened. And the great majority of the time, it involves very young people. Now, Duncan and Miles fit the exact profile of people I have documented in Missing 411 a Sobering Coincidence. Young people, super athletic, disappear, and are later found in areas that can't be explained how they got there. As I went through Duncan's research, and I, I read the feelings of the family as they went back and forth to Europe as they had a great young man, super good son, really good brother, and he disappears in another country under such unexplained circumstances. It would dog me forever. And I'm sure it, it dogged the McPherson's. And then in Miles' case, he's with his family on Christmas vacation, something they've done for 15 years. And suddenly he's gone. I applaud, applaud the Robinsons for going outside the realm of probably what the police recommended in hiring a private search and rescue group. If you are not going to get satisfaction in looking for a loved one, then you have full authority to go, go get help and go get people that will be engaged. But on Miles's case, it's really intriguing to me that the first day these volunteer searchers are looking, or these paid professional searchers are looking, they find him at the bottom of a rocky cliff in a boulder field. How come the helicopter the police had up didn't see that? Yeah, why not? According to what they said they searched, that would have been in the search area. Hmm. Was the body there when they were searching? Where are Miles' shoes and socks? Friends, I appreciate you being here. I don't want to rant, but I think the points are important. And until people start absorbing what I'm saying, in Miles's case, that was a young man who disappeared in the middle of a big town. In the middle of a big town. At 2.50 in the morning, not many people on those streets. dumbfounds me but please share these on your social media accounts uh, below this uh, below the screen you're watching the first comment will be the pinned comment and in there I'll put the uh, links to a lot of our videos on this channel if you just click on the Can-Am Missing logo at the bottom left of your screen, that'll take you to our videos, over 400 of them. 
And I hope you watch them all. It helps us, us if you're watching them. Helps us a lot. And sharing the videos. Make sure you're subscribed. That's a big, big biggie. I can't tell you how many people have said they're not subscribed. And they thought they were. And you can follow me at David Politis at Can Am Missing on YouTube. And uh, I'm on Truth Social as well. Be kind to your family. Be kind to your neighbors. When you go out into public, do something nice for someone out there. Be a good person. Let's spread some goodwill. And that's the backbone of a good villager, being a good person. Politis out.